Well, you know, I really, really appreciate the fact that you've got out of bed uh, at work, whatever time it was for you on a Saturday morning. I'm usually still in bed at this time on a Saturday, so it's uh, a bit of a shock for me. So if I suddenly go back to it, you know, it's uh, because I've just uh, completely lost the plot, I think I'm uh, still asleep or something. Um, so thanks very much, Ben, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to be talking, or so as Ben said, um, this is a talk which is based on a blog post that I wrote. I won the PepsiCo Women's Inspiration Network Award a few years ago um, for being an inspiring woman in tech. And uh, as part of the award, they wanted me to write a blog post. So I kind of panicked about that and thought, what, what on earth am I going to write about? And they said, well, write something inspiring. So I thought, okay, no pressure. <laughs> so uh, I asked uh, I asked around and said, what, you know, what on earth am I going to write about that's inspiring? And so several people said, well, just write about your life and what you've done and stuff that you've been interested in. So basically I did that, wrote the blog post, um, and lots of people liked that. And then I got asked to put a talk together around that blog post. And so basically this is that too. So, we start off with um, this little girl here. So, you can probably guess who that is. Um, it's quite a long time ago now. Um, someone asked me a while ago, when did I first know that I was a geek? Uh, and I kind of thought back to when I was about this age, I guess, which is, oh yeah, so this is me. Uh, amazingly. <laughs> I did it a bit differently. I wasn't always a crazy redhead. Like, um, I thought back to when I was about eight or nine, probably, and um, I didn't actually know that I was a geek, but thinking back, um, what I used to do at that time was to save up all of my pocket money each week, and about once a month I used to go to the local uh, shopping centre, and I used to always go to WH Smith and run in there to buy mass textbooks, because mass textbooks, for me, were like the best thing that I could ever spend my money on. Uh, and then, I, you know, like we'd go home, I'd just spend hours and hours uh, pouring over mental arithmetic puzzles and riddles and stuff. So um, I guess at that age of eight or nine, I was already a confirmed geek, even though I didn't know it at the time. And um, so um, I'm really talking about my life, I guess, and the challenges that I've come across. And so, you know, everything was fine at this uh, age of eight or nine. There was me, my mum and dad, my brother and sister who were younger than me, and we just had like a regular, normal family life. Um, but what happened when I was 12 was that my mum died and um, my family basically kind of went into disarray. Uh, my dad remarried and, uh, to someone that it, just, it wasn't a great time. <laughs> um, and so that was when I was 13. And then so when I was 16, I left home and I, I was doing my A-levels, but I was unable to continue with them because of my living circumstances. Um, so I left school as well and uh, got a job, moved to London, um, and uh, to cut a long story short, got married when I was 20, uh, and then this is me at 23, uh, with three children. So I got married at 20 and had my daughter, and then um, I thought, well, while I'm, while I'm off work, I have another baby, like after two years, and then I'll go back to work uh, with two kids, but what happened is I had twins. Uh, so at 23 I had three children under three, um, and of course that wasn't the easiest thing to uh, cope with, um, but I loved it. Um, but then what happened was that my marriage broke down, <laughs> and uh, I don't know why I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> my marriage broke down, and so at 25 I was a divorced single parent with three children, living on a council estate in Brixton. Um, so, you know, not, not the greatest position to be in. And um, I suppose I kind of wondered what on earth am I going to do to support these kids? Uh, you know, like they were then uh, four and two, uh, and two two year olds. And um, what I thought I ought to do was to basically try and get back into education. Because if I'd taken a job, uh, well, the only jobs I probably could have done would be like those back in the retail. So I would have been on minimum wage, and with three kids to support that would be very difficult. So I thought I have to get an education so that I can earn um, money, basically. Um, and so what I did was I went to Southwark College and did a math school, a math course at night school. Um, and that went well, so then I uh, went to South Bank Uni, uh, at Pitt Castle, and did a degree in computing, and here's my graduation. Uh, so here's my graduation. So it was 
I think I was the uh, second oldest person in the class of about 100, and about um, eight women, and it was basically mainly 18 year old boys, about 70, 18 year old boys and me, and a couple of other people. Um, but actually, it was amazing, it completely changed my life and uh, really gave me a lot of confidence. I think uh, because of all the things that happened to me, I was very lacking in confidence and very shy. Uh, but doing a degree, meeting lots of really great people, uh, really boosted my confidence. And uh, I guess my confidence in my ability uh, myself. So I got to my degree and then that went well. So then I did a PhD in software engineering. And here it is, here's a cover. <laughs> so um, I really enjoyed um, what I really wanted to do with my PhD. I, was, I was very, got very excited about the fact. So I started it in 1994, so it took me seven years. Um, but uh, what I really enjoyed about my computing degree were well, several things, but one of them was um, I always thought that technology is changing the world and it's the main thing that's really making a difference and more and more uh, is going to make a difference in, in everybody's um, future. And uh, at that time, uh, there were lots of I think, negative stories in the press about big computing systems. Uh, failing, and so computing was seen as very negative. And there were stories about, um, I've forgotten the names of the systems then uh, at the time, but like big banking systems that failed, or, uh, yeah, I can't remember any names at all. Um, but, uh, so around that time, lots of uh, computer systems that were failing, so that everyone kind of saw computing, who didn't know anything about it, it was a very negative thing, you know, it's like taking a lot of jobs. Um, but it's not doing a positive thing and, and it's like lots of people think it's a, a waste of money as well uh, because lots of companies and government were sinking lots of money into big IT systems and, uh, and then they were, they were not fit for purpose basically. So it's great that things have moved on uh, quite a bit since then. So what I decided I really wanted to do was to help uh, people who are maintaining the big systems and so my PhD was all about looking at uh, code and the look effect, um, which is, you know, if you make a change to one bit of code, what's the look effect of that across the whole system? Um, and so it's trying to help people maintain the systems to make sure that they didn't completely mess up the whole system. So to make sure they, they didn't mess up the whole system by making a change in one place. So here's the introduction. Actually, I don't know why I put that slide there. You can use that. <laughs> but this, this is just a diagram that gives you a better idea of at the very, very lowest level what I was trying to do. And so basically looking at uh, variables interacting within uh, a module, and, uh, which is called intramodule propagation, and then uh, intermodule propagation, so uh, different modules or functions uh, affecting each other. And so basically I've built a prototype uh, tool in C to, to calculate the, the ripple effect. Uh, as it was. So, uh, when I was doing my PhD, I ended up, uh, because I was in, um, I started off in formal methods, right, which is a very, very mathematical uh, part of um, computing, and moved towards software engineering. But when, especially at the beginning when I went to conferences, um, it would quite often be about 300 guys and about three women um, at the conference. And um, when I did talk to women, uh, we would say, you know, I want to show more women around that we could talk to. Um, and so one thing that I did in 1998 uh, to try and do something about that was to set up an online network for women computing. So I set up a group for women called uh, London Business Women in 1998, and then that was really popular. We ended up in the Daily Mirror. Um, and so I set up a, a nationwide and international group in 2001, and so this is one of our first um, <coughs> And so um, at a BCS meeting in um, 2003, I first went up to Fletcher Park. So who here has been to Fletcher Park? Oh, good, okay, it's not enough. <laughs> you all need to go. I was there yesterday. Um, at the National Museum of Computing, and uh, if you're interested in, in tech or computing at all, um, I highly recommend it. And um, I'm going to tell you a bit more about it 
in a minute, but one thing to say is it's only 36 minutes on the train from Houston uh, and then it's over the road, so it's an easy place to go for a day trip. It's my sailing trip over. Um, so I went up to Fletcher Park, which is where the code breakers were during the Second World War. So you can see these two pictures here, the mansion house and the house. Um, and so it was a 52 acre site in, during the Second World War, and now it's about 26 acres. Uh, because half of it was sold off for development to raise money for the site. Um, but there's, and there's two museums there, so there's one is the Fletcher Park Trust and one is the National Museum of Computing. Um, so I went to Fletcher Park for this meeting, and after the meeting, I went for a walk around to find out more about Fletcher Park because I didn't know really much more than, I suppose in my head I thought um, code breaking, Second World War, so wasn't it like about 50 old guys sitting around wearing like three jackets and smoking pipes and doing the times crossroads uh, and then doing a bit of code breaking on the side. I think that was kind of the image I had in my head. So I walked around the site and then bumped into the guys that were rebuilding the bomb machine, Jerry Bomb, and uh, all the machines were destroyed at the end of the war, all of the code breaking machines. So they were re rebuilding this amazing structure. Have you seen the imitation bomb? So, so the, the, the bomb is called Christopher in the imitation bomb. It's a big machine that Turing's building, which Turing didn't actually build. It was um, uh, Howard King. But, um, so there were some guys rebuilding this machine, and it just looked incredible. It was an amazing feat of engineering, so I started chatting to about it. And um, uh, after that, the, um, the guy, John Harper, I was talking to, said to me, well, you know, why are you here? So I said, oh, this uh, meeting, we're in computing. So he said, oh, well, did you know that more than half the people that worked here were women? So I said, no, how many people worked here? And he said, more than 10,000. But at that point, I was amazed, because I honestly did think it was like this young guy sitting around in the room, you know, uh, head breaking. So that made me think I want to do something about this, to raise awareness of the women that work at Electric Park. So, <coughs> so we ran a project called Women Station X, because Electric Park was also called Station X, um, about uh, women, and we interviewed lots of women uh, because I really wanted to capture their memories because, of course, they worked there during the war. Um, they were all getting on with it. Um, so I interviewed lots of women and ran a project called Women's Station X. And uh, at the launch of that, uh, Simon Greenwich, who's then the CEO of Fletcher Park, uh, gave a talk and said that Fletcher Park was teaching on a financial knife edge. Um, and so I thought, well, that's not right. You know, why, why haven't they got funding? It's a, a fundamental place. Um, and then a few weeks after that, I went up to a reception at Fletcher Park and found out that actually the the code breaking that had been done there had shortened the war by two years and that 11 million people a year were dying at that time so potentially it's say 22 million lives and I just thought this is ridiculous why haven't they got any funding and so basically I started a campaign to say that. So I set up a blog um, and then at that time I was head of department of computer science at University of Westminster. So I emailed all the heads of professors of computing in the country since 2008, asking them to sign a petition that someone else had set up on the 10 Downing Street website asking the government to help save the actual park. Um, and so I sent this email out with a new head of department, a bit frightened because I was sending it around to all the people whose, you know, like, whose textbook that I'd used in my degree. Uh, and I was kind of like, oh my god, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. This email out to all these people. Um, but I sent it around and almost straight away I got emails back saying, you know, thanks very much for, for letting me know about this. There was loads, I looked at the petition and loads of uh, heads and professors that, um, you know, really, really well known in the UK were signing a petition. So I thought, okay, it's not just me uh, that thinks this, it's people um, it's in my community too. So that kind of gave me the confidence to, to carry on. And then with a colleague at the University of Westminster, we wrote letters to the Times to try and draw more attention uh, to the situation at the actual park. Uh, and then I contacted all the journalists that I knew, which was going back through uh, at the time, saying, can we help to publicise this? Um, and basically what happened was that Ron Kleckham Jones was one of those, uh, the BBC technology correspondent, was one of those people. And so he got me on the uh, Today programme in the morning and uh, BBC News. And uh, so it was on the news all day. And that was amazing. What happened was, I had about 200 emails from people all over the uh, world saying, you know, we support Electric Park, what can we do to help? 
Um, and, and so that was wonderful. But then a few days after that, I realised that. Um, that you can only get something that you want to really cut out your own story. You can't go back to the same story again because it's not needed anymore. So for quite some time, I was half year I'm trying to work out what to do about it and how to get and get the car back into the And then, cut a long story short, a few months later, I saw this tweet. I was asked to use on Twitter. Uh, so at the end of 2008, early 2009. So I was asked to use on Twitter. And then I saw this tweet uh, from Stephen Fry, who was stuck in a lift. And so apparently they, they tried ringing the bell in the list and they tried banging the number, but no one was listening, so they were still stuck. So he tried tweeting a picture uh, of himself in the list. And I saw the picture and I thought, Stephen Fry, he must be interested in virtual cards. So basically I sent him several direct messages asking him to help. And then the next morning, he tweeted a link to my blog. And so my blog had been getting about 50 bits a day, which I thought was incredible. Um, but then when Stephen Fry tweeted a link to it, I got 8,000 hits that day. And that kind of helped me to realise that, that um, if you find the right people, you can make a difference really quickly. So I think you know, there was kind of almost more response from Stephen Fry tweeting about Electric Park than from, um, from being on BBC News, and a more kind of sustainable uh, effect. And so that day that um, Stephen Fry tweeted the link, I was the most retweeted person on Twitter in the world. But that was 2009, that will never happen again. <laughs> 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 um, so, basically, over a few years, really, um, I and lots of other people use social media a lot to raise awareness of uh, the situation at Fletcher Park. And um, mainly through Twitter, we. Uh, really, um, just made lots of things happening happen by approaching lots of different people. And it was something that kind of I started, but just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And loads of other people came in. Um, some really uh, great people just went off and organised things on their own, like fundraisers for Lecture Park. And so, it, you know, it started small, but social media and music just really showed me how if you, you know, you only have to start with an idea and some kind of passion and enthusiasm and kind of get there, get out there, talk to some people, and then talk to some more people, and then they talk to people. And you know, it just builds up into this amazing, amazing thing with all of these people uh, trying to make something happen. <coughs> so one of the most amazing things about being involved in Electric Park is getting to know the veterans. Um, so 10,000 people work there. They're all, well, unfortunately, most of them uh, have died, but they're still... Um, about a thousand men, I think, who worked there. Um, but they're just incredible people. And um, I've just had loads of conversations with them over the years and got to know some of them quite well. Um, and actually, one of the worst things about being involved in Bletchley Park is I think all of the, almost all of the veterans that I've known recently were all dying now since I've been involved over the last few years. Um, but one of the the, one of my favourite stories from the veterans is uh, I was invited to the Enigma reunion dinner um, one year. And so I sat down at a table of ladies in their 80s and I said, so, you know, I know what you did kind of at work at Bletchley Park. What did you do outside of work? Um, have you got any stories about stuff that you got up to? Um, and so one of the ladies said to another, Oh, do you remember that time when we uh, nicked a bicycle to go to the, uh, uh, sorry, we nicked the biggest bicycle to go to a dance? So I, so I said, yeah, that's the kind of story that I want to hear about. What did you get up to outside of work? And so, of course, I didn't mention that most of them were about 17 or 18 when they went to the park. So basically about 8,000 18-year-old girls were working there. <laughs> so you can imagine what they got up to. Um, and so, so I said, yeah, have you got any other stories like that? And so um, one of the ladies said, well, um, yes, the, the local uh, RAF pilots did get into trouble, so I said, what happened? So she said, well, the, the local RAF station noticed that lots of the planes were flying low over Woburn Abbey, which is where lots of the, um, the women were living. So the plane, um, <coughs> they, um, they couldn't work out why the planes were flying low over Woburn Abbey. Um, and then they found out it was because the, uh, the women that were working at Fletcher Park in the summer, they were going around to up, up onto the rooftop. Uh, at Woburn Abbey and sunbathing topless. And the guys are still trying to get a good look. So that, that, that's my favourite bit of the past story. It's not about coke breaking at all. And so, um, so this is 
obviously I'm a bit of a Viking Mountain View. Uh, so we just did loads of stuff on social media and uh, towards the end of the campaign I got invited over. But also I um, met a Google uh, VP uh, during that time and uh, helped to create a relationship between Google and Fletcher Park. And, uh, and part of that was me going over to Mountain View and giving a talk, uh, another talk that I did, which is called the Twitter Safe Fletcher Park. For you know, much more detail about what we did with Twitter. Um, and how it was successful. So it's a new group of And then in 2011, um, Simon Grinch, the CEO, said in a meeting, you know, I did not talk about saving Bletchley Park, and he said, Sue, you don't need to say that, say that anymore, Bletchley Park is safe. Uh, we need to talk about building Bletchley Park. So that was a very kind of like a fundamental moment. I just sat there, and you know that, that in like in cartoons where you see. Um, it was like someone gets stunned and they have like birds flying around their head. I kind of had one of those kind of moments, like, oh my god, three years, oh, is it all over again? Did it work? So that was really cool. Um, so I've, I've got to back my book right. So I've, I've now written a book about um, the campaign called Saving Virtual Park, which will be out later soon. But you can sign up online if you want to <coughs> right now. So, kind of moving on from uh, the whole Virtual Park uh, part of the talk. So, does anyone recognise who this is? It's not me. <laughs> yeah, computer says no. So, as I was saying earlier, kind of through, through my career, I love technology. I've always thought, since I started my degree, I've just thought technology is the future, it's the way that um, it's just going to do so many amazing things. And I really think that it's going to. Um, save the planet because I think it's going to connect up with people that can really sort the big problems out that we've got now. And I, I kind of started to really see that happening, especially in the last year or so. Um, so I've always thought computing is a great thing, really positive. But talking to most people outside my kind of like tech or geek uh, peer group, loads of people um, that I've had conversations with basically think computers there's no that's how I see it. They just see it as a very negative thing. Um, and I suppose a few years ago, I just thought, I really want to now take time to try and do something about that. So what I did to start with was um, to come up with a, like a workshop program which included stuff like Scratch and uh, um, uh, app, app, app design and app design and um, coding and Python on Roger Pies. So I put that um, program together and uh, started running it in schools. And so we ran workshops with the kids, which went amazingly well. It was all very exciting. Um, but one of the things that I realised was that the, the kids got very excited about it, and it's quite actually easy to teach kids this stuff because they're used to being at school, they're used to learning stuff. There's no real barriers there at all. But I noticed when we got the parents in at the end of the day that some of the parents were just totally there and they wanted to try stuff out with their kids. But quite a few of them were very apprehensive, and especially. Uh, the mums just seemed to be quite disconnected from it and wanted their kids to do it but didn't want to go anywhere near it and I guess they were just getting scared of it. So that kind of um, led me to think uh, about doing stuff with mums. Um, and then I found out that actually if we want to affect kids, the, the uh, main political success factor for kids doing well at school is actually their mums' education. Uh, and that's uh, that was quite a surprise, but I suppose when you think about it, in a traditional family, at least, the, the mum's one that's there kind of, you know, forming the child's opinions of things all the way through. Um, and so the way the mum see what, sees the world is going to really affect the way that um, kids see the world. <coughs> so that, and, and also the fact that I really want to um, try and encourage more women uh, to think about doing stuff in technology or related to technology um, led me to put together a program called Technoms. And so we do stuff like uh, basic IT skills um, and then app design, web design, social media, online security and then uh, the last one is uh, coding and Python. And um, we found that it's, so we, we've been running it in town hamlets um, for just over a year and we just started running in Dublin. And we found that um, the mums, so we take 20 mums in a class um, in a school. So it's run in a school, uh, we take 20 mums in, uh, over five weeks we go through the programme that um, I just talked about. 
and two hours a week, uh, we basically uh, work with them to help them understand kind of the jargon and uh, really try hard to uh, get them to overcome their fears with technology. Because lots of them are very scared of what. So an example is one of our mums said, um, "I'm scared of the keyboard." She said, "I know, I know all these letter keys are, but all those F keys at the top." I'm really scared if I touch one of those, something terrible is going to happen. Right? And I think that's quite, you know, that's quite a common feeling from the mums that we've had coming along. They kind of want to do it, but they're actually, you know, they're scared they'll do something which will totally screw something up uh, at the same time. Um, and so, taking us through the programme, we uh, work hard to improve their confidence um, and their skills and get them hands on as well with, uh, with hardware as well as with software to try and just really demystify it and build their confidence around technology. <coughs> so what we found, um, we've got Bruno University uh, running a research project alongside what we're doing. And what we found was that not only did the mum's technology skills uh, and confidence improve, but actually their general self-esteem uh, absolutely rocketed and that was like the biggest change factor. And we had a videographer come in in the, the first week uh, the program interview the mums in the pilot and she came in the last week as well uh, and she said that she couldn't believe it was the same mums because uh, they just looked so different um, after going through the program. So here's some of our mums on the call. So Amina on my right is the mum who said she was scared of the people. Uh, yeah. And so at the end she said she's not scared of uh, computers anymore. One of my kind of favourite stories from the mums that have gone through is actually a million story. So she runs a, a school uniform shop in the market in East End. And uh, she said that she really wanted to learn how to add attachments to emails. And that she'd done that on the course. So I said, well, you know, why, why, why did you want to do that? And she said, well, in my shop, I need to send samples out to clients. Um, and what I normally do is I get the samples, you know, I pass them up, then my son comes around after school and he takes them on the bus over to wherever London uh, the client's based. She said, but now that I can add attachments to emails, I can take a photo of the samples with my phone and I can just email it to them. So my son doesn't have to get, you know, go across London on the bus every evening. And I just thought, that's such a simple thing. You know, like for all of us, adding an attachment to an email is just one click, right? It's nothing. <laughs> Um, but if you don't know what you're doing and you're kind of scared of it, then you, that, that can just completely stop you from being able to do very, very simple things. And simple things like that can change a whole family's life. And so this is Nick Saul, the head teacher at the school. Um, and he said to me that not only did he notice the change in their moms during the program, but he also noticed the change in their children, in that they were more uh, confident and happy. Yeah. So here's our moms. I've got a video here. Check that. Did you leave that to the sound? Okay. The actual video is on the news. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, pounds. which is the heart of the digital community in the UK. The industry is currently worth about £121 billion. Pounds. But there's a problem. If you think someone who works in tech, you probably think of a man. You probably won't think of a woman, and I think almost certainly you won't think of someone who's a mum. I think that lots of mums uh, lack confidence around technology. Uh, they may be scared to use the computer, scared, scared even of the keyboards. And so that means that they can't take up the opportunities that there are in technology. And I think that's a big problem. So at Sabify, we've created Tech Mums. Tech Mums is all about helping women really gain confidence and understand the opportunities that there are out there in the digital world. So in just 10 hours, we take mums through things like app design, social media, web design, uh, programming on multi-pies, and a bit of online security. Our aim is to help them understand what opportunities are out there and give them the confidence to be able to take those opportunities. I think workshops like this are really important for 
it's good to, to get people to kind of feel the same way about stuff together. I think so they were all scared of technology to start with. And so you don't have that feeling of going into a class where everyone knows more than you. Everyone knew that they didn't really know very much at all and they were all a bit apprehensive. I don't know what it was called. <coughs> But um, I think, yeah, definitely have more confidence now and help me. I don't know. I've learned basic skills, which I'm really pleased about. I don't feel afraid of computers anymore. I don't feel I'm an expert now, but I do feel I just want to jump into it. One of the things that I've learned to date is that if you become scared, push away the fear, just go for it. And I've got to say, so far, I've really, really enjoyed it. But the course, since we began, has gone really well. Um, the conversations we've had with those mums and with the children of those mums have been brilliant. And they now feel very confident that they've you know, had a chance to design an app, that they've had a chance to uh, look at online safety and be assured that sometimes they're doing the right thing, because sometimes they're not doing the right thing. We're really, really, really pleased with the course and proud of the mums and proud of the community. I would absolutely offer a technical course again. What I would really like to do is give this opportunity to everybody that wants it across the country or even across the world.
my uh, message, if I've got one, uh, is that, so, you know, I've had this career in computer science, which has been great, but I've also kind of on the outside really followed my passions and, and done things that I really wanted to do. And it's actually those things in combination really that's um, changed my life from being, you know, that, that mum on council estate uh, with three kids wondering what on earth I'm going to do to, to feed my kids. And we basically did live in poverty um, for about three or four years while I was studying. Um, and I didn't always know how I was going to feed the family. Um, and over time, that's a really horrible thing to have to deal with because it's very, it kind of like grinds you down. Um, but luckily, I worked out that education and education technology was a way out for me. Um, and so that's really taken me to some amazing places. You know, like I never would have dreamed that I'd speak at the UN. I mean, just how on did that happen? Um, I never would have dreamed that I'd gone to Google and given a talk there. And I've just done so many cool things, which have all come about really, I think, from me keeping going and following the things that I really love, doing the things that I really care passionately about. And last year I even met the Queen, so that was cool too. <laughs> and so my kids are now growing up. Um, my uh, oldest daughter is uh, 31 now. And uh, yeah, so here's a pic for my kids. They're, they're all doing well, they're all happy. And so one of the things actually that, that was um, I found out about recently was that, you know, so I found out about some of the other kids in our estate uh, where we lived in Brixton. And so, you know, my kids have done well. Got good jobs, they've got happy lives, but um, some of the other kids on the estate have ended up going to prison, being crack addicts, um, and uh, in, it's not the difference is not only because I went to university, got an education and stuff, but I do think that education really does open your mind and open doors to things that, that just you don't see or you don't know about if, if you don't do that. So that's it, thank you very much.